Hello everyone and welcome to the next um, show of Teaching Physical Sciences. Today we're joined by Marissa. Hello Marissa. Hi, how are you? I'm good, how are you? Okay, thanks. That's good and we've got Dylan behind the buttons working his magic. Today we're going to be talking about how to teach grade 11 thermal, oh I get it wrong Marissa, it's gas laws and thermal properties. Yes. Yes, it's quite a mouthful for it. Though say. I think it's much more gas laws and much less thermal properties. Well, yes, you did say so. Why? Well, having looked at, the, at what CAPS lays out as the content, there isn't much in there that I would describe as thermal properties, except maybe the temperature aspect of gases. Yes, um, I suppose so. Seeing mm. as I've actually gone through the CAPS document, I see what you're saying. Yeah. Yes. So I think the emphasis today will certainly be much more on gas laws. Okay. And on the kinetic molecular theory of gases. Yeah. Well, I look forward to getting into more detail with it. Remember that you can join mm. the conversation if you use the hashtag VT Science. And of course, you need to be on Twitter to use the hashtag VT Science. Dylan will then pick up any questions or comments and then pose them to us. Before we get on to teaching strategies and things like that, why don't we take a look at the mindset resources we currently have on system? Marissa, I went through our YouTube channel and I found that uh, I found six links, I think. One, two, three. Okay, it's a lot of links, which is uncommon. So this must be quite an important subject to master. Well, this. I think it's important, but it's, it's also interesting and it's easy to do experiments in it. And it teaches you a lot of other important things uh, in terms of skills, in terms of understanding graphs, in terms of testing out the um, uh, particle nature of matter. I okay. mean, it, it picks up the issue of particle nature of matter quite powerfully because gases are quite easy to treat in that way. Yes. And um, so the, in, in that way, I think it's, it's quite a nice topic to get a handle on, both in a quantitative and a qualitative way. Okay. Well, if you are struggling with the content or not so much struggling, but need an extra revision on the content, click on any one of these, um, these links over here. Obviously, you can't click on them now, but I'll put them up on my blog later on, and then you can click on them there and you can watch them to brush up on your content knowledge. So shall we go to the teaching strategies then? Five point teaching strategy. Okay. Yes. Okay, five point teaching strategy. I like you know, as a maths teacher, I like putting out steps. It's five points, and so that's why I say five-point teaching strategy, because then everyone can remember five points. You've laid out five points over here, and at the bottom I see you've got something in capitals. Yeah. Care to elaborate on the capitals? Well, it's a hobby horse of mine, but so much of the physical science is taught by what we call plug and chug, which means that I give you an equation... I give you all the things in the equation except one, and you plug them into the equation and you get an answer, but you don't really know what you're doing. That's very true. And so for me, it is so important that whatever these equations are, it's what they mean which is so important and what they're telling us about science that's important. Okay, so definitely do all calculations with understanding and try and encourage the understanding with every calculation. And also in a sense of what the quantities mean. You know, what is a big pressure? What is a small pressure? What is a big volume? What is a small volume? What does it look like in real life? Those mm -hmm. are things that we really need to keep our minds on as well. Uh, Shall we like go through them point by point, starting at the top? Well, at the heart of all the teaching of the gas laws lies the uh, kinetic molecular theory. Now, I haven't put it on any of the slides, but I think it's particularly interesting that when you do atomic theory and the history of atomic theory, you learn about all the different models of the atom, and you eventually learn that atoms are mostly empty space and so on. 
But this is one of the theories that actually uses the Dalton model of the atom. Okay. That you treat the atom as a solid sphere, which according to the kinetic molecular theory has only um, limited space and limited mass for the sake of the laws. But you start with the kinetic molecular theory. Does this link to any previous content? Well, when you do the history of atomic theory, you do learn about Dalton. And you're immediately told that his theory about uh, solids, uh, gig, that uh, of atoms as solid spheres is rubbish. But a model is sometimes you use the simplest model that's going to work for what you want to explain. Okay. So in this case, you only need that very simple model. You don't need to know about electrons and protons and all that. Okay. You just need to know about solid spheres. Okay, so we start with the kinetic molecular theory. And then we go on, um, and basically there are three laws. But the two most famous ones are Boyle's law and Charles's law. And they've both got their own interesting things about them. Boyle's law is interesting because it deals with inverse proportion. And it's one of... The, there are a few other things in physics maybe where they meet inverse proportion. But we promptly do some mathematical treatment to make it look like direct proportion. Yes, I saw that on your slides, yeah. the switch between. And uh, Charles's law, to me, is so important because it provides the prediction, the experimental justification for the absolute zero Okay. and where the absolute zero comes from. And then Gay-Lussac is just there as a kind of um, completion because you've got three different variables and there are three ways of looking at them one against the other. Yes. And that leads us then finally to the general gas equation, which relates all the three, pressure, volume, and temperature, to the amount of gas. Uh, and the R in there is just the gas constant. Okay. Now, I see that you've said deal with Boyle's law experimentally, then calculations, and the same thing for Charles' law, mm -hmm. then calculations, then Gay-Lussac, and unfortunately the presentation on nine hasn't updated. It still says Gay-Lussac. Maybe we should mention quickly some texts do say mm -hmm. Gay-Lussac and others say Gay-Lussac. Is the name really that important with this one? The name is not important, and in some textbooks you won't even find the name. Okay. Uh, but uh, the interesting thing is that the CAPS document writes Guy Lussac, but everywhere you look on the internet it actually says Gay Lussac. And I knew it as Gay Lussac. So, so maybe it's a spelling error within the CAPS document. Uh, possibly, yeah. Yeah. Well, I don't know. As mm. You would know more mm. than me. But uh, the point I was going for is that you've said then calculations, then calculations. And then at the bottom, you brought up the formula. Is that the, the same calculation, that formula, that you would do with the Boyle's Law and Charles' Law? Well, the point about doing Boyle's Law and Charles's Law separately is you're leaving out one of the variables. So, yes. for example, if temperature doesn't change, you can use Boyle's Law without going to the general gas equation. Okay. And if pressure doesn't change, you can use Charles's Law. Okay. So you're teaching mm. one change at a time. That's what you do at the beginning, but when you get to the end, you've got an equation that allows everything to change. I mean, for example, if you're sending a weather balloon up into the atmosphere, yes, all three variables are going to change. Yes, so that would be an example you only present right at the end of it. That's right. Okay. And, but right at the beginning, mm. you would change just the mm. temperature. But I make a point of saying do them experimentally. Now, you may not have equipment to do all these experimentally, but a lot of this work can be done with syringes. Mm. And syringes are easy to get from clinics. Yes. They, they throw the needles away. You can get those plastic syringes. Mm. Uh, so they're very, very good for, uh, for doing a lot of these experiments. Yeah, I'm sure you could even ask for donations from... The mm. syringes that haven't been used, mm. maybe, or something like that. But you, you do them, you can even do them qualitatively, just to see that the pressure actually, when the pressure increases, the volume decreases. Okay. Even if you don't do it quantitatively, but to see the phenomenon actually working is important. 
you must excuse me. I do get, as I explained a little bit uh, earlier, I get a bit confused with words and things like that. Explain the difference between qualitative and quantitative. Well, with quantitative, it's an experiment where we do measurements okay. and we get numbers out of it. So any time we use the equation or any time we take measurements, that would be quantitative. Okay. Quant qualitative comes from the Latin qualis, which means what kind. Okay. So uh, there I would be doing it to see what kind of change is taking place. Okay. But the interesting thing is that in this gas laws, we really do get onto some important quantitative relationships. Yes. And I'll get into that a bit more when we talk about the laws separately. Yes, I, I did get that impression as well. Mm -hmm. Shall we go on further to three pressure points? <laughs> The three pressure points, I like this slide because it states three areas where we possibly don't focus, if we don't put enough emphasis on it, then the learners aren't mm. getting the right kind of work or maybe you know, not the right kind of work, the right kind of idea. It's a, an area that is crucial to this understanding. Well, I usually describe them as big ideas. Oh, well, I like that. <laughs> Because for me, the big ideas are things that if the kids don't get this, they're dead in the water. Yes. So if, you don't, if they don't get this idea, then, then they don't understand anything. They might be able to plug and chug. Yes. But if you give them a problem that's slightly different, then they're going to get stuck because they don't understand. Yes. I like that. Big ideas. And mm -hmm. yeah, the first one says particulate ex explanations of the three gas laws are very important to relate kinetic molecular theory to the gas laws. Yeah, maybe we could have not had two lots of gas laws in that statement. I'm thinking about it now. <laughs> okay. Well, why but, don't you re-explain it for us then? Um, the, remember I said to you that the kinetic molecular theory was so important. Yes. Now, often when teachers teach this section, they teach the kinetic molecular theory and then they go on to the gas laws and they forget all about the kinetic molecular theory. Okay. So now why did we do the kinetic molecular theory? It's so that we could understand why Boyle's law, Charles's law, and all the laws, why they are the way they are. What causes? What causes the pressure? If you, if you increase the pressure, what causes the volume to decrease? What are the particles doing? Okay. So in the kinetic molecular theory, for example, it says that pressure is caused by the particles hitting against the walls of the container. Yes. So if I compress the gas, in other words, I make the volume smaller, there's going to be more times that the particles hit against the wall mm. of the container. And so that explains, using the particle theory, why it is that the pressure increases if I decrease the volume. Yes. And equally, if I talk the other way around, maybe I'm going to... Uh, decrease the pressure, then fewer times the particles will hit against the side of the container and therefore the volume will now increase if the piston or wherever mm. you trap the gas is free to move. So if we don't draw that comparison between mm. the particles mm. and the change in pressure, then it's... Then it's, it doesn't, you know, there's nothing, you can't understand how it's working. Yeah. So to me, every time you do the laws, and some textbooks, what they do is they teach Boyle's Law, and then at the end they say explanation of Boyle's Law using kinetic molecular theory. For me, I would rather put the kinetic molecular theory right up front yeah. so that the moment you're exploring the phenomenon that the um, pressure increases if the volume decreases and vice versa, that's a qualitative explanation. And now we get to the very special quantitative relation, which leads me actually to the second bullet. Okay, and the second bullet says, understanding the proportional relationships and how they are represented graphically is vital. Okay, now what I've found with a lot of learners is if you say that A is proportional to B, or in this case P is inversely proportional, if they say A is, well let's work with V and T because that's a direct proportion. 
if V is proportional to T, then I say to learners, what does that mean? And they tell you, oh, that means that as V increases, D increases. Yes. But if uh, I draw a graph, and I draw a graph that says as V increases, T increases, it could look like this. Yes. It could look like this. All these are graphs where if that is um, V and that is T, all these are graphs where as V increases, T is increasing. Yes. But when you get to a very special relationship which is proportional, we're talking about a straight line that goes through the origin. Okay. And I'm not drawing a very straight line. but No, I can see that. Uh, but that's... Uh, but the point is, that means that if V doubles, then T doubles. Okay. If V triples, that's a very special relationship. Yes. And it's also not, there's something called a linear relationship, where in this case, it is a straight you're going line. Off screen I'm thing. going off screen. Yes, Let me do so it here. Uh, it's a straight line, like I'm drawing. Yes. <laughs> Maybe I need a ruler, which <laughs> doesn't go through the origin. Yes. So that's also not proportional. Mm. So that's not proportional. Okay. That's not proportional. That is proportional. Okay. Are they required to know the symbol? Yes, I think it's actually mentioned in the CAPS document. Okay. So. If I write V is proportional to T, I write it like that. Okay. Okay, let's look at the third one. Use of simulations models is very important for understanding. Well, it really relates to my first, um, to my first bullet in a way because yes. um, it's more like a teaching pressure point than a content pressure point. Mm. It's about how you should be teaching this. You cannot teach this without using uh, particle models or simulations of one kind or another to make it clear to the learners exactly what the particles are doing. Okay. Yes. Well, on that note, that's a good note to start the let's get practical section. Okay. So uh, we are going to go to a slide now that shows representation in chemistry. And it's showing the triangle that John and I have spoken about in previous um, chemistry things. And John has called this the Johnston's Triangle. Is that because he likes his name involved in something, or is it really called the Johnston's Triangle? Well, it actually comes from the researchers. Um, people cracking their heads to try and find out why chemistry is so difficult to teach. Okay. And there was a Scotsman... Uh, who I used to see a lot at conferences because I'm old enough to have, <laughs> to have seen him, called Alex Johnston, who came from Glasgow, and, and um, he did a lot of really good work. But one of the things that he did come up with was that one of the reasons why chemistry is so hard to teach is that because we, the teachers, keep moving from one form of representation to another without saying that we're doing it. Yes. And sometimes we're not even conscious that we're doing it. But what chemistry is about is we see real things at the macro level. We see gas, gases in syringes, we squash them, we unsquash them, we heat them. And that's what we see with our eyes. Mm. But chemistry is very much concerned with relating that to the world of atoms and molecules. Yes. Which we can't see. So most modern chemistry books have taken Johnston's recommendations very seriously and they have a lot of representations showing what's happening at the submicro or the particulate level. And that is the bottom left-hand corner of the triangle. Okay. But there's another form of representation that we use a lot in chemistry, which is the symbolic. Mm. And the symbolic is the use of equations, formulae, and so on. So an example of getting mixed up between the macro and micro is, for example, the word element yes. is a macro word, but the word atom is a micro word. Yes. 
And teachers keep mixing atoms and elements and molecules and compounds and not saying what the difference, the real difference between them is. Yeah. And in this section, there's quite a lot of symbolic stuff in the form of graphs and equations, but not chemical equations, mathematical equations. It does sound like something that you would almost take for granted if you have a certain level of math, uh, not maths understanding, science understanding or chemistry understanding, you take for granted micro versus sub micro level, macro versus sub micro level and then teach t thinking that your learners think the same way. But, but if you're not overtly conscious of it, I'll give you an example. Yes. I can say the gas exerts pressure or I can say the particles are hitting against the wall of the container. Now those two sentences, the first one is phrased at the macro level okay. and the second sentence is phrased at the sub-micro sub level. Okay. So one needs when one is teaching to explicitly make that connection with the learners. Yes. And I often draw that triangle on the board when I'm teaching. It makes sense too. So it's not a secret that I keep to myself as a teacher. <laughs> I share it with the kids. I think it makes a lot of sense. I think it's a good strategy to use when teaching these things. Okay, shall we move on to the kinetic molecular theory? Kinetic molecular theory, yes, of gases. And you've uh, made a slide that basically defines everything for us. How would you teach these definitions? Are you going to stand up there as a teacher and just spew forth knowledge? Or? Well, um, in a minute we're going to look at uh, one of the simulations that's freely available on the internet. But um, I don't know if I would teach this without some kind of representations of particles in a container. How would you start? Would you start with the representation of chemicals in a container or would you start with the definitions? Well, I might start with grade 10 work. Okay. Because in grade 10, they've been, they dealt with the arrangement of particles in a solid and a liquid and a gas. And you, learners are notoriously bad at remembering what they did a year ago. <laughs> yes, so, they are. <laughs> uh, one has to remind them. And then from there, I would say, but we are now going to concentrate on gases. Gases are very interesting. Uh, in fact, if I was realistically drawing a representation of a gas in a container, in a box that size, I might, just for your sake, fit two particles. <laughs> and they'd still be too close to each other to really reflect reality. So they really are very far from each other okay. in relation to their size. Yes. So I would start off with that. And that's the very first sentence of the gas laws. In fact, in that first bullet, that's a very compressed bullet. Okay. It's there for teachers, not for learners, because if you open up any textbook, I think you'll find that they are separated out into uh, separate, several points. Okay. Okay, so you're saying there's a whole lot of there's content a lot within that up, bullet. Packed up in there. I'm going bullet. to read it quickly. Refer to negligible size of particle in relation to space. That's one. Yes. They're constant and random motion. That's two. The weak attractive forces between them. Three. And the elastic nature of collisions. Four. Okay, so all of that is encompassed mm. in kinetic molecular theory of gases. And they all hold... Um, I think in some books they say that's true about real and ideal gases, which we'll get to later as well. Yes. But it's mostly true about ideal gases. I know on your um, five-point teaching strategy you yeah. say introduce kinetic molecular theory of gases and then immediately after go to the ideal and real gases. Yeah. Some books stick it on at the end. Okay, I don't have huge scientific um, understanding, but that doesn't really make sense to me. Why would they do that? Because they're dealing, you know, like physicists like to take friction out, and okay. they've got this ideal world that's got no friction in it. Yes. It's much easier to make mathematical models of things that are in an ideal world. Yes. So all the laws like Charles's law and the ideal gas law and all, they only apply to ideal gases. 
In other words, it means that the gas particles uh, for real gases would I attract each other to some extent. Okay. So any gas that's close to becoming a liquid would not be ideal. Yes. So you would say introduce it at the beginning so that you can constantly say this is how an, a real yeah. gas would, or yeah. to start with, this is how an ideal gas would perform. This yeah. is how the real gas does perform. I mean, the one that breaks react. down most with a real gas is the weak attractive forces. Uh, it's much stronger attractive forces with the ideal, with the real gas. Okay. Okay, and then you cite the temperature of a gas and the pressure of a gas. Yes, and um, the temperature of a gas, um, and this is an interesting thing because it's a direct link between temperature and how fast the particles are moving. Okay. Because kinetic theory, if you remember back from your physics, is one half mv squared. So it's not proportional to the velocity, mm. but it is strongly related to the velocity. So the faster the gas particles are moving, the higher the kinetic energy of those gases would be. So each particle would be moving at speeds higher than we would have gas at a higher temperature. So basically, when we heat up a gas, the particles move faster. Okay. And um, the problem is this concept about the average kinetic energy. And when we were talking earlier, for example, I told you that some books have this graph which looks like this. And what you've got here is you've got number of particles. This is too small. Am I going off? Uh, no, you're right and, on. Uh, and here we would have the um, speed of the molecules or the velocity. I won't get too uh, worried about that distinction at this point because they are changing direction as well. Okay. Um, but the point is you would have maybe a few that are moving very slowly. Yes. You've got a few that are moving very fast, and you've got a majority of particles perhaps that are moving and that their, their velocity would average out there. So this would be very strong. I wouldn't say it is the temperature, but it's very strongly related to the temperature. Okay. And you say that the, you've said that some textbooks have this in, and some that, don't. That's right. And they, then they will often show you, which I might do in another color, um, that at a higher temperature, this curve would have the same basic shape, but the the average would be higher. It goes to reason then at a lower temperature, the curve would be on the other side. That's right. Okay. So if I would go to a lower temperature, I don't know if I can fit that in having so nicely, that might be a lower temperature. And the other thing is it flattens out more. Okay. As you move in that direction as well. Oh, that makes sense. Okay, so you're in front of the class, you've spoken about all of these things and you're wanting to now talk about, uh, are you distinguishing at this point between the micro and the, sorry, the sub-micro and the macro level and symbolic, or are you moving on and doing something else? Well, at, at every point, I would be going between micro and macro. Okay, so whenever I'm talking about the gases, I keep referring to the real situation. I keep referring to what the particles are doing, even if we're working at the level of calculation. Okay. Shall we take a look at um, uh, what's on the next? It's the YouTube clip of the FET simulation that we're going to look at now. I will be posting the link to the FET simulation. Unfortunately, we weren't able to play it up here. But Dylan's going to press play on the clip. And we see that some species, large species, have been put into the container. Why don't you talk us through what's happening? Okay. The FET simulation allows you to um, put either large particles or small particles. Okay. And they, the purple ones are the large ones and the red ones. Uh, now, if you have an internet link at school, or you can actually download this ahead of time, 
So if you have like a data projector, even if you don't have an internet link, um, you can play this in the class and you can get learners to come up and make changes to the system. Okay, so in the simulation you can actually make your own changes. You don't have to follow what this YouTube clip has now done. Now the YouTube has chosen particular things, but you see there's a little burner at the bottom or it's an ice sometimes. Yes. It's either fire or ice, but uh, what it does is it allows you to change the temperature. And there's a thermometer up in the top right-hand corner and uh, that allows you to uh, to see what's happening to the temperature. Okay. And then on the left, I think there's a little man pushing um, there to change the volume. He pushes that left side in. Uh, someone had fun drawing that. Uh, and then that pump actually puts more particles in. Yes. Whereas I would have thought maybe it would increase the pressure. The one, that's what I would uh, think as well. There's one thing I need to mention is that when you are doing the gas laws, and this you have to be careful with the simulation, is that the gas laws apply to a fixed amount of gas. Okay. So when you're doing the gas laws, you can't add more gas or take gas out while you're studying the variation of the variables. That's an important part to mention when you're teaching. Yes. You see now, uh, you've just seen the man push the thing in, and you, therefore that would be like maybe doing Boyle's law, in which case we're keeping the temperature constant. So I suppose you could use the simulation to actually introduce all three of the laws. Oh, all three of the laws, but you can do them one at a time. Yes. Uh, of course, when we get to the general gas law, you can add more gas because there you've got the number of moles of gas yes. as well in the equation. That's actually quite nice to use the same simulation throughout the, the teaching so that they can see that it's, you're teaching about the same thing. It's... Just I've changing I've various things. I've actually found that uh, when I visit schools, quite a lot of teachers like these FET simulations mm -hmm. very much, and they're free as well. Mm. Yes. Okay, I like the next slide you sent me quite a lot because it shows right representations and wrong representations. Uh, you know, often there's this assumption when you open a textbook that it's going to be completely correct and that's not always the case, is it? Well, this is a very common misconception. I've seen it in a lot of textbooks. Um, that, And sometimes it's the way that the author has chosen to draw the molecules because the author wants to put arrows and then when they put arrows, they can't draw the molecules or the particles close enough together. Mm. But in reality, and this is really grade 10 work, but... The reality is that li particles of a liquid are touching. That's why you can't compress liquids. Okay. And if you look at the representation at the top, yeah. they've got the particles apart from each other, which suggests that you can compress them. Mm. Uh, now, the difference between the liquid and the solid is in the solid, they're arranged in a regular way. Yes. Either in a crystal but in some kind of pattern. Mm. And in the liquid, they are touching each other and they slide over each other. And even the illustration that I've got there, as I said, has got far too many molecules of gas for reality. Yes. But it does show you the spaces between them. Yeah. Well, teachers out there, watch out for this error. I wouldn't have actually picked it up myself, but I'll forgive myself for that. Uh, shall we move on to, I think it's Boyle's Law? Oh, no, real, ideal versus real gases. So you've taught kinetic molecular theory, and then you move on to the ideal versus real gases. Well, I probably would even be referring to them while I was teaching the kinetic molecular Oh, good. Theory. So it's, you're not teaching section, section, section. No. You're teaching... But having particular. taught that I would then make that distinction um, very clear because for example any you've done um, now the grade tens won't have done intermolecular forces but any gas which has got a polar molecule yes. where the one has a potential to attract the other like water uh, is likely not to behave ideally 
Okay. So in fact, that is one interfering factor when you're doing experiments using the gas laws is that there's always water vapor in the air. Yes. And that kind of, if you're trying to get nice results, that kind of messes it up sometimes. So if you were really, really scientific, you would have to dry out the air and get rid of the water vapor. Of course, if you're living up in Gauteng and you're doing those experiments now, there's very little Especially water Especially in winter, there's not much water vapour. Yeah. But down in other areas, like Cape Town, you're going to find mm. more water vapour. But it would... Uh, you know, it's not that bad it's going to mess up the results so badly, but mm. it's something you need to be aware of. Now, if you took water up to maybe 2,000 degrees centigrade, then it would behave like an ideal gas because the particles would be moving so fast that the collisions would be so strong between the molecules, they wouldn't have enough opportunity to uh, attract each other. Okay. Is that possible, physically possible? To take water up to, yes. Okay. Obviously not in your science classroom. No, I would <laughs> don't try this at home. <laughs> okay, so you, you've taught this and you've now made the distinction between the two yeah. that you've taught through the yeah. kinetic molecular theory. And we're now moving on to those three gas laws. Now, we've spoken, oh, no, we're moving on to the graphs of ideal versus real gases. Well, this is, as I said, now this is a symbolic. I'm doing the triangle now, and I'm saying these are symbolic representations. Mm. And they're showing you the dotted line showing how, um, if I look at the pressure-volume relationship, how the real gas would deviate in behavior from the real gas. And it's much easier to see in figure 7.2 because there we were expecting a straight line. Yes. And you find that at the lower temperatures and the lower pressures, it starts to deviate. That's why I talked about heating up the water. Mm. Um, but I think if you wanted to show the problem in the Boyle's law, which is the left-hand representation, you might want to plot d p against 1 over v so that you'd find why you're not getting a straight line. Yes. Volume versus pressure and pressure versus temperature. Oh, that's pressure. I'm oh, sorry. I, I, I was thinking volume versus... But it's the same thing. Pressure versus temperature would be the Gay-Lussac law. Okay. Okay, let's move on to the laws. So we've gone through all of those and we look at Boyle's law, which is changing of which the pressure of a uh, fixed amount of gas is inversely proportional to its volume at a constant temperature. So the temperature is cha staying the same and we're just changing the pressure. That's right. So you've got these three variables. You've got P, you've got V, and you've got T. And so... Have so these three variables come up sufficiently in the kinetic molecular theory and all of those things? In the kinetic molecular theory, we explained that temperature was a relationship in relation to the kinetic a measure of the average. We talked about pressures being the particles hitting the walls of the container. Okay. We haven't explicitly talked about volume, except to say that most of it is empty space. Okay. But um, the point is you've got these three variables. Now, if you want to investigate quantitatively, yes, you usually want to study two variables at the same time, and that's exactly what happens. So the first two variables we study on our own, on their own, is pressure and volume, and we keep temperature constant. And How would you explain to the learners that you're keeping it? What reasons would you give for keeping the temperature constant? Well, in the old curriculum, they had that learning outcome related to scientific investigation and studying variables in relation to each other. Yes. And a lot of science is about... So it really relates to the nature of science, that if you want to see if a change in volume is caused by a change in pressure, you've got to eliminate all the other things that could possibly also affect the change. So um, somebody once said, you must say, um, 
cows moo softly, I think it was, uh, change something, measure something, and keep everything else the same. So it's change something, measure something, keep everything else the same. And in this case, the thing that you really got to keep the same is the temperature. Okay. That this cows move softly. I really like that as a, a way to explain it. Okay, so temperature has stayed constant and you're changing the pressure and you're measuring the volume. That's right. So, well, you could do it two ways. Uh, and that is what we call the independent and the dependent. Yes. Theory. Change, the thing you change is the independent variable. Yes. That's the thing you choose to change. The thing you measure is the dependent variable. And okay. the thing you keep the same is what they call the covariable. Uh, but so in the case of Boyle's law, I could do the experiment in two ways. What is the experiment? The experiment would be somehow to trap, uh, would be somehow to trap a volume of gas in a way that I could change the temperature. Okay, so I think, I think we, we have a slide on. of... Do we have a next slide on that? Yes. Now, this is the best kind of apparatus because it hasn't got what I call noise. Okay. The what easiest, is noise? This one, this one requires you to spend some money because you've got to go out and buy that equipment. It's okay. a nice demonstration thing, and it's very easy to use. But okay. not everybody's got money. Yes. But this one, why I like it is it hasn't got a lot of noise. The experiment, which is inexpensive, is simply to take a syringe, put your finger on the one end of the syringe, trap some air, mm -hmm. and then you could measure how hard you're pushing on the syringe to get the volume to half. Okay. But the noise is you would have to include the air pressure, you would have to include the pressure, and pressure is force over volume, and there's so yes. many calculations. I understand what you mean by noise. Right. So no. if one didn't have that apparatus, I might do it only qualitatively. Okay, so that you're mm. just illustrating mm. the change rather than measuring it and getting But it. let us look at this, because you can look up YouTube, and you can probably on YouTube find... Uh, a YouTube video where somebody's using this apparatus. I don't think that would As be As a second place, it mm. probably is a good solution. Mm. First place would obviously be doing something like this in class. Now, the nice thing about this is it just shows you the apparatus on the left. And the middle one shows you connecting a kind of bicycle pump. Yes. But the nice thing is you've got a gauge there. The gauge reads the pressure, and you've got a measure of the volume. Mm. So you can read the volume, you can read the pressure, you can take a whole lot of different readings, and you can show that every time you do it, P times V gives you the same answer, if you've got the same amount of gas. That's another variable that you need to keep constant, which we don't talk about, uh, because we said it's for a fixed yes. amount of gas. But so really, there are two variables you're keeping constant. It's the amount of gas and it's the temperature. Okay. But in terms of independent and dependent variable, I could do an experiment where I select the volumes. Yes. So I say, let me try at one liter, two liters, three liters, and measure the pressure. Or I could select the pressure, one kilopascal, 1 1.5, two, and measure the volume. Okay. Now, that has implications for when I plot my graph. Because if I... If I select the pressure, then P must go on the x-axis. Yes. And V must go on the y-axis. And, of course, students always mm. get confused with dependent versus independent. That's why this cows move softly is a nice way of thinking about it's it. It's fantastic. Shall we take a look at the, the graphs that you've got on the slides? Obviously, they're um, the symbolic representation, then. That's right. And... They show you two things. They show you how physicists and chemists, I guess, play tricks to try and um, uh, get straight line graphs. They really do acrobatics, if I can put it that way, to try and make things into straight line graphs. Those of you who teach maths, yes, 
will know. Careful. <laughs> I'm talking to one here. Will know that if you um, if you take a relationship like that, where pressure times volume is a constant, that is what we call a hyperbola. Yes. So when we plot that graph of P against V, we get something that looks like that. Yes. And that's not very helpful for us because the slope of this graph is always changing and it's, it's quite difficult to work with that graph. So what scientists do, they say the equation for a, stra for a proportional relationship would be P equals K times something. Yes. So what would that something be if I turn that equation around? The something is 1 over V. So if I now plot P against 1 over V, then I will get a straight line that goes through the origin. Now, do you find learners get this confused? For me, I think what one has to do is get some actual values. So even if you haven't done the experiment, get some values, put them in a table, let yes. them plot this graph, let them have a table that says... P, V, and then 1 over V. Okay. And then they get the values for P, the values for V, the values for 1 over V. And let them plot these graphs themselves so they can see that it comes out to a straight line. Yes. Uh, the nice thing about this is in maths they would have just finished doing functions, so the plotting functions will be fresh in their mind. It's good to have someone on hand who can tell me that. <laughs> Shall we move on to the Charles law then? Yes. Okay, the volume of a fixed amount of gas is directly proportional to its Kelvin temperature at constant pressure. So uh, now we are looking at temperature and volume. Okay, so to go back to our three uh, variables. Charles moves, moves softly. Pressure, volume, temperature. Yes. And now with Charles's law we're investigating these two. Okay. And we're keeping that. It's very easy to keep pressure constant because anything you just do in the atmosphere, yes. as long as I don't squash it in any way, I'm keeping the pressure constant. Okay. Uh, so all I've got to do is get some gas. Now, the problem is if I heat gas and I don't l give it a chance to expand, then I will be increasing the pressure. Yes. So... Um, what we want to do maybe is look at the experimental setup there, and you can see okay. they've got some water, some gas in a in a small tube there, yes. And they've got a little drop of oil there to trap the air. But the nice thing about the oil is the oil easily moves up, yes, when the gas expands. Of okay. course, that that's the way thermometers work. We know even liquids expand when they heat it. Would thermometers be a good example to use in the classroom when you Well, they us? often call this a gas thermometer. Okay. Because it's measuring how much, if you could calibrate it, meaning I could put marks on there to show where that oil drop sits mm. at different temperatures. But for me, the most powerful thing about, uh, about Charles's law is if you actually do this experiment and then... You go and you plot. Now, this time, very often what you would... Again, you can set it both ways. I can wait for a certain temperature, and then I can measure the volume. Okay. Which is what I want to do, because I want temperature here. Yes. And I want volume here. Okay. Now, the trouble is, in real life, when you do this experiment, you get some points. So, if that's zero... Yes. Okay. Uh, we'll get some points here, like maybe I'll have... Maybe I'll first put it in ice. Mm. So I might get a reading at zero, okay? And then I maybe heat it up to 20, and I'll get a reading here. And then I might heat it to 40, and I'll get a reading here. Yes. And it seems like all these, and even to 100, maybe, and they'll get a reading here. Now this is, they are sort of in a straight line, but they seem to be going nowhere. Yes. And to me, this is the most powerful thing about this Charles's law experiment is because if I now draw this line like that and 
the point is at zero degrees centigrade, the volume is not zero. So this is not a proportional relationship. And this stands. would be where you introduce Kelvin then. That's exactly it. So if I extend this graph backwards, it hits the zero somewhere here, which is actually minus 273. It wouldn't be perfectly accurate when you do it in, uh, uh, in the lab. But the point is, this is theoretically the temperature when all gases become liquids or solids. Yes. The volume is zero. And when I say the volume is zero, I mean the volume of the gas is zero. So what the scientists said, well, we like proportional relationships. So we're going to invent a new scale of temperature. Yes. Where this is our new zero. Yes. And what was the old zero is now 273. Okay. And this is the what we call the Kelvin scale. Was the scientist's name possibly Kelvin? That's where the Lord comes from. <laughs> he was Lord Kelvin. Okay. <laughs> That's what I, um, I, I was thinking as Lord Charles, no, but it's Lord Kelvin. Okay. And uh, so he came up with this temperature scale. Of so course, there's an American equivalent. You know, the Americans use a funny uh, temperature called Fahrenheit. Yes. And there is a, an absolute zero equivalent in Fahrenheit as well. But the point is, it's the temperature at which all particles stop moving. Yes. And they've never actually got down to that temperature. They've got to, like, just within a few millionths of a degree. Sure, that must be but frustrating. Not everything to actually get has no energy at absolute zero. Okay. Okay, shall we look at the symbolic representation of Charles' law? And it's basically the graphs that you've just drawn, and then the one mm. with the direct proportion mm. with the temperature in so Kelvin. So we've more or less done that, really. Yes. So the, the macro would be the experiment. The sub-micro would be um, talking about... What about the particles? Why why does the temperature, if the temperature increases, why does the volume increase? Yes. And you might do that explanation via pressure. Because if you remember the experimental setup, the particles hit hard against that oil drop and make it move up. Yes. Um, or if I, uh, so I think mostly one changes the temperature and then sees what happens to the volume. Okay. Although in a refrigerator, for example, you suddenly expand the gas and the temperature goes down. Oh dear. But we won't go there. Yes, that sounds like a conversation for another time. Yes. <laughs> uh, let's look at Gay Lussac's law. And Gay Lussac was um, talking, well, if we've talked about pressure and volume, and we've talked about volume and temperature, then this must be talking about pressure and temperature. That's right. In this case, now we're going to keep the volume constant. And I'm going to draw them the other way around so that we can put these two together. Also, still the same amount of gas. Okay. Um, but now we study this relationship. And that relationship is very similar to the relationship between volume and temperature in that it's a direct proportional relationship. Okay. So I think uh, normally... One does that very quickly because the two famous laws are Boyle and Charles. Yes. But just to complete the picture, we do bring in this one as well. How much time would you spend on this? Is it well, it just should a quick be, glance over? Or? It should be fairly easy to do this one because they'll see the logic. I mean, I haven't talked much about the, the equations. You'll get uh, the P1V1 equals P2V2 for Boyle. And the V1 over T1 equals V2 over T2 for Charles. Okay. Then if you look at that, the um, Gay-Lussac one is P1 over T1 equals P2 over T2. Okay. So it kind of just completes the picture. Yes, it does complete the picture. Well, in fact, one could even ask the kids what they think. If you've just done Charles's law, that's a fantastic idea. Is to ask them to think what what how it might be. Maybe send them home with the challenge after you've done the two laws. Or Go let home, them work in groups in the class figure it out. on yes. the challenge. One of the two. 
what do you think the success rate would be in them finding it out for It themselves? depends how much you've taught your kids to think. And that's the most important thing in science, is teaching them to think and understand. Well, of course, it was in capitals at the bottom of the yeah. teaching strategy. So that's if you've it. taught them enough, from, it's almost a good assessment of yourself. Yes. It, a little private assessment, so you don't need to tell anyone that you're doing it, but you could watch them and see if they understand it, if they're able to draw those conclusions, then... And are you, you helping them to think? And then to really reward the ones who do show signs of thinking, not necessarily yes. with something material, but really praise them when they yes. do show signs of thinking. Yes, because it, that kind of thinking opens doors to a whole lot of other careers they can go into. Now, we do have a slide of an experiment that we can do. with. It looks very similar to the previous experiment. Yeah. It's one of those don't do those at home things. <laughs> because, I mean, actually the good example of that, except the temperatures going up, is the pressure cooker. Uh, that I can do at home. <laughs> <laughs> but this one, I mean, I'd be a bit scared because um, that's a pressure temperature relationship where we keep the volume the same. So having a, a uh, glass container means it, ca uh, it can't expand, it, but a pressure cooker is the same. Okay, I'm thinking now. No, I'm not thinking. Don't worry, carry on. Uh, <laughs> but yes, a pressure cooker would be a very good example of Gayle Sachs Law. I don't know how common they are these days because people do everything in the microwave. <laughs> I think they're coming back. <laughs> they're coming back. Well, I don't know. I've been watching these TV shows where they've been cooking a lot in them. So. But that's, that picture of the, of the experiment scares me because I'm thinking maybe that glass is going to shut. <laughs> yes. Hmm. And that's difficult yeah. to explain to management Yes. when you need to buy more. When you need to buy more kids as well. <laughs> <laughs> Whoopsie, sorry. Okay, shall we move on to the micro, uh, not the micro, the symbolic representation of this, which is, of course, another graph. Yeah, and you can also use this experiment in the same way that we used Charles's law to get to the absolute zero. Okay. So uh, but the assumption here is straight away that the temperature is in Kelvin. Units seem to be quite important in this section. Kelvin and what kind of volume, or what unit would we use in volume? Actually, for these gas laws where we are, until we get to the general gas equation, it actually doesn't matter. Only very important thing is to keep the units consistent. Okay. And to keep temperature in Kelvin. Okay. Well, you have mentioned the general gas law, or mm. sometimes called the ideal gas law. And we've got it on a slide. I see at the top it's in a capital P, but then with the general gas equation underneath, it's in a small p. Does this matter? Well, actually, uh, it's just the book that I took it from, I think, that okay. had it in that way. I've often seen it in a big P as well, so I don't think it's significant. Okay, so it's not significant then. The, the ideal gas law, it's specifically for ideal gases? It's specifically for ideal gases, and the most important thing is it's the one that brings all the gas laws together. Okay. And um, the first formulation allows you to vary the amount of gas as well as the pressure, volume, and temperature. Yes. So it's a much more powerful one. The general gas equation, which is below, just allows you to work with a fixed amount. And notice I'm using the word amount, yes. not mass. Now, amount is directly related to mass, but if you look at that N in the gas law equation, it's the amount of moles. Okay. And mole is the SI unit for amount. Yes. So um, that's and why... And they I have done that previously, I think. I think, I don't know when they do the mole, but um, it might... I think they do do it. Pre you know, I'd have to go back and check the CAPS document. Where but maybe, maybe you people out there know yes, better than us. Yes, they just know. <laughs> I, I think they would have ha had to, yes, they would have had to have done the mole first because otherwise you can't teach the section. Yeah. yeah. Okay, we are running short of time, unfortunately. So I'm going to jump to the last section, which is called One Last Thing. <laughs> So 
So Marissa, what I've been doing is reading this book called Teach Like a Champion. And yeah. I've been reading it in very small chunks so that I can say a little bit about mm. it every week. Basically, it's got 49 actionable steps within it that teachers can do within their class to just apparently teach like a champion. And, well, I think that most of them have been pretty good. Occasionally, they're controversial. This one, I think, is a good one. It says, without apology. And basically, it's saying, don't apologize for the content or for the students. So it's saying, when you stand up there, and for, let's use this section as an example. You stand up there, and you as a teacher think it's really boring. So you stand up there, and you say, I'm sorry, we're doing this really boring section now, but we've just got to get through it. Or you think it's too difficult for them, and you say, I'm sorry, this is actually quite difficult, but blah, blah, blah. By doing, by apologizing for it, you are not um, giving the content due credit. You're making it, the students already have a negative attitude towards it. And I'm not going to talk about the students just yet. I want Dylan to go to the next slide which was a quote from the book and it's it's talking about this man's teacher and how he really this man didn't want to go to this class but then the, his teacher professor o'neill somehow convinced me that the well-being of the world urgently required me to stay up late reading william wordsworth and that's what a good teacher will do they'll take something which is boring or is difficult and make it alive make it interesting make it something that the people within your class actually want to do so that's the challenge with that over there now it talks about also um not apologizing for the students and i know i've been guilty of this in the past i will say well you know shame she's going through a hard time so we won't expect that much from her uh, it's not saying don't care about your students it's saying don't give them an excuse not to work. So yeah. I like this one quite very, a bit. Very, very nice. Yes. yes. So don't apologize if you're out there. Don't apologize for the content you're teaching or for the students that you're teaching. And we have gone past four o'clock. It's been wonderful having you, Marissa. And thank you, Dylan, for all your button pushing. And we will see you again next week when we talk about grade 12 chemical equilibrium. Thank you and bye. Bye-bye.